Hello, it's Brett. I'm here to explain Ruby blocks. Ruby blocks are an integral part of the Ruby programming language. They're these anonymous functions that you can use in your code. They're also called closures in other languages. It took me a long time to feel confident in understanding them, and then took even longer to feel confident in writing code that uses them. So I'm going to cover everything I know about Ruby blocks in this episode. We're going to start at the basics and then we'll test drive our way through three examples increasing in complexity until we get to a point where hopefully we feel good about blocks. Let's start with some really basic blocks and some common usage. A lot of early Ruby tutorials will show you something like five times do puts high. Let's run that. That will output the string high to standard out five times. This do and end is the block syntax, and then it runs what's ever in the block. You can use outside variables in there, which is kind of cool. So you can do something like string is high, let's call it greeting, and then you can put greeting. That's cool. Let's change high just to make sure that worked to be howdy. Right? You could change this code to be something a little more uh, complex. Like we could have greetings that are hi, howdy, hello. Yo. We'll do that. You could do greetings.random. Okay. That's not a thing, it's sample in Ruby. So you can see now we're getting different uh, code output there. You can do multiple lines within here, right? You can do puts two plus two or two plus one, run that, runs it every time. So you have scope, you have access to outside variables, but uh, it runs, the times method is being called and we're giving it this block of code. That's cool. Blocks also have these arguments. So times by default has i, which is the index of the thing that we're going through. So um, if we put i, you'll see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 being output before each of our greetings. And that is the uh, value that we're at. It starts at 0 because of indexes starting at 0. And we could actually do something like instead of a random greeting, we could do greetings i. And we'll see howdy, hi, hello, yo. And then this empty sh line with nothing there because it's calling puts nil because we're saying five times do greetings, but we only have four greetings. So if we change this to four, we won't see that empty line, which is kind of cool. We could also do greetings.length. Um, I spelled greetings wrong. Let's run that again. Now we know that it's exactly that many times. We only do it as many greetings as there are. So if we add another one, which is, let's add another one that's like, ooh, what's another good greeting? What's a, what's a, we'll do that. Cool. So that works, but this kind of putting of the greetings and all of this is kind of verbose. Ruby has a different syntax that's based in blocks that lets us do that. And we can just call each do greeting, delete all that, and then we can actually just put greeting. That does the exact same thing, but it's quite simpler. So before we had Oops. Before we had this, where we loop through the number of items in the greetings array so many times, and then find that element within the greetings array using the index, but instead we can simplify it to each. And that's quite nice. Uh, so this each syntax is a block that we use to iterate in Ruby. Blocks have another syntax where instead of doing do end, 
that is the same thing as doing replacing do end with curly braces. So the general Ruby style guide, if we run that again, it does it twice. The general Ruby style guide is if you can fit it on one line, use curly braces. If you're doing multiple lines with your block, then use do and end. This will still work. Like you can do this. So you might see that code sometimes out there in the world, but generally it's do and end for multiple lines. So that's a very foundational example of blocks. They're useful for uh, iterating through things. They're that's like one of their main usages, but you'll see them in other places too, where um, like basically all of our spec if we require spec helper and then we do our spec describe, you know, foo or whatever the class is, do end, those do ends are a block. So describe, we uh, pass this block in, which it does stuff, which is another block. And then we finally call expectations, expect stuff to happen or whatever, right? We'll do dive more into testing some blocks that we write. But um, all of this is blocks, which is pretty cool. Um, and yeah, you'll find that they're used a lot of places. But let's kind of dive into coding sum up. So that was our blocks example. And um, that's kind of neat. But what I want to do is Ruby has this thing called, this method called map. So you can call greetings dot map do um, greeting. So this goes through each of the greetings, does something to them, and then creates a new array. So um, we'll say greeting is equal to We'll say greeting first dot upcase plus greeting one negative one. So that brings it to the end and it basically uppercases the greetings. So then if we do puts new array, and we don't need to assign this here, but we can do also, let's call this formatted greetings. We'll put the formatted greetings. Okay, we're seeing implicit conversion of nil onto string type error on line eight because it is failing for some reason. And I don't know why. Oh, it's because hmm. I don't know why that's feeling. Oh, now that's working. Um, I think maybe negative one as array access. Maybe that doesn't work in Ruby. Or we need a range. Oh yeah, we needed a range. So that was my bad with the code. But this map, now we have formatted greetings where it's uppercase. So you can see down here the H is uppercase, the Y, the W which is cool, but we still have our greetings array. So we can call this again, actually, and we'll see that those exist too. So map returns a new array. Let's test drive creating our own map because I think that's kind of nice. Um, and then really quick before we do that, I want to show something in Ruby where map comes from, where you can do map bang with an exclamation mark. And what that does is it actually modifies the greetings array so if we do map bang, it modifies the array of greetings to um, include all the elements will be this modified code in the array. So this is destructive and it returns, it returns greetings, but that's the same greetings array as up here, which is just something to be aware of. And we'll code for this case too and show the differences. Um, let's undo that and we'll uh, start writing our code. So let's start with a test. 
Uh, we'll do... We're going to override the array class in Ruby for the sake of this example, but I wouldn't do this in real life, probably, maybe. Uh, it's called monkey patching, but uh, yeah, I don't think I would necessarily do this, but it's really good for this example. So we're going to rspec describe array do. We'll just run that really quick. No examples, it passes. Let's describe, I'm going to call it rmap kind of like O-U-R, as in the map we're writing, but also R is in Ruby, and R is just short, so it's kind of like our version of mapping. And we'll say it returns a new array of the elements with the block supply, with the executed supply, with the executed block. Yeah, we'll do that. So what this means is, just like in our other example, and we'll do a kind of trivial example. We'll say one, two, three, dot R map. We'll say new array, because it's going to return a new array. We'll just call this item. We'll say item times two. So we'll just multiply them all times two. And what we'd say is we'd expect new array to equal to an array that contains two, four, and six because we're just multiplying them all by two. Let's run that spec and we get a failure. No method error, undefined rmap for array. Did you mean map? Because we don't have rmap defined yet. We can do that really quickly here. We'll do class array. I'm gonna put the class code in our specs just to make it easier to look at and manage. But like in reality, this would be in a different file, right? Uh, let's. So this opens up the array class that comes from Ruby, and we're gonna define a new method called rmap. Let's run the test again. It, pa it fails, but for a different reason. We got nil because our rmap is just returning nil in an expected two, four, six. So what we can do instead is we'll say, um, we're gonna have a new array because we're not making a destructive change, and we'll do something along the lines of self dot each do. Remember we had each before, item. And then this is where, so we've just been using the block syntax, but we haven't been writing code that responds to it. And then all you do is you yield, you call yield, which is baked into Ruby. And that says, call whatever block code is in here. And then um, pass it in and a parameter. So like for our map here, we have item. And this is what we get. We uh, call, we reference this item here, which means we need to supply the item within our map. Um, and then what we'll say is we'll say new array dot push the executed code that does the multiplication. And then we'll return new array. Let's run that. Hey, it passes, right? Uh, we have new array, we push the item into the array that's yielded. We can also add more lines to this, but it will just return the last executed value gets pushed into the new array. Um, like this is the return, the implicit return, which is in Ruby. If we explicitly re return early, hmm, that's interesting. Maybe I'm wrong about that. And I might have some learning to do about that. Because returning might get out of the whole method entirely. But anyway, we know it returns the last item into the array map. So um, that's neato and I think kind of cool. Let's get rid of the high. That's just an example. Let's say something along the lines of uh, it works with the pretzel syntax. In Ruby maps, you can call, I'll open up IRB over here. You can call something like um, let's say we have a struct called name. Uh, person struct, and let's say we have 
an array that's person.new let's call that people that's an array of objects called people if we do people dot first dot name we have Brett if we do people dot first dot uh, or people dot last dot name we have Chet let's say we want to output all the people's names into an array we could do this we could say names is equal to people dot map we'll do the single liner here just to use it in an example you'd have P for the person and you return p.name, that would give you an array of, that's not what I expected. So that's interesting. Oh, I guess that is expected. Let's just say, oh, I know the problem. So, let's redo this example. Let's say people is an array of, uh, let's say, person.new, Brett, you don't pass in, because I passed in a hash, it then assigned name to hash, but instead we just want to do this. So we'll do person. like this. Now we have people.first.name, people.last.name, before it was returning the hash, which was assigned to that value, which isn't what we want. Um, then what we could do is we could do people.map bracket, or the open do person for p, p for person, and we'll do p.name, and that returns an array of names. So we could say names is equal to that, and that's useful if you needed an array of names to output or something like that. A simpler syntax than this is to do what is called the pretzel syntax. So you do ampersand colon whatever the method you want to call on the object is, and then that will automatically map it. It's that's a proc. It's a proc, which I won't get into procs in this really, but that is a an example of the pretzel syntax. And let's just make sure that our new R map works with the pretzel syntax. So we'll use doubles here. This is a really great case for doubles. And we'll say name. We'll just use the exact same code from before uh, from the IRB. Simple use doubles from our spec to make this a little bit easier. And we'll have chat and we'll call our map with the pretzel name. We'll say names. We'll say expect names to equal Brett and chat. And then let me close IRB. So if we run that, it passes. So that just works automatically out of the box with yielding and Ruby blocks and everything like that. Something you can do too is you can pass the block as a parameter. If you put an ampersand in front of it, then you can call block.call. That does the exact same thing, but it's kind of like a more verbose syntax. This is useful if, let's say, you needed to, you had another object that you wanted to pass the block to, where, like, let's say here, instead of push block.call, we instead just pass the block. We could pass it to another object that could then call it, so there's some usefulness for this, but for this example, we don't need it. So um, there's our map, but let's do our map bang just to illustrate what that would be like because I think that's uh, just to show how the implementation would vary, but we're still using blocks. We'll say it modifies the elements in the array with the executed block. I'm just going to copy our example from here. And instead what we'll say is we'll say We'll just say array is one, two, three, four. And if we call array.rmap with the bang, with item times two, we can then say expect array to equal one, two, three. We need to make that an array. And we need to multiply it. So two, four, six. 
So this looks similar, uh, the test, but here we're testing new array. And we could even solidify this test by saying original array. If we, if we felt like we really wanted to make sure it wasn't modified, say one, two, three. I'm going to run that separately. OK, so that pass is just expanding that test. Now we go back to our map bang, and it says no method defined, undefined method R map bang for array. Did you mean map bang, R map, or normal map? So we need to define it. Let's write that and save it. It we expected two, four, six, but we instead got one, two, three because our method isn't doing anything. Let's instead, let's use map. We'll copy this implementation, but instead of saying new array, we'll say each with index. So that, here's, here's a good example of if you're using a block. Each with index has two parameters. The first one is the item. The second one is the index in the array. And then what we'll do here is we'll say self, which is the array of one, two, three. We'll say the self at that index is now equal to the item, or sorry, just the yielded item. And this gives us the, um, we need the index so that we can properly replace the array's item with the yielded with the item executed through the, the block that we're passing in, which is cool. Um, and now that passes. If we run all our tests, they all pass. So that's cool, right? Difference here is we're modifying self. Here we're creating a new array. Let's also test that um, it returns the array. Let's say expect returned array to equal array. Because I think that's an important aspect of this. Um, so yep, it returns self. So we know that that you could, you wouldn't normally take the return value when you use bang to test it or to do something with it. You would just call array dot whatever. But good to test it and make sure that that works as expected. So that's one demo of using a block. This is. Useful if you're building code where you're iterating through things and uh, want to build a new array or select certain items, that sort of thing. A lot of this is baked into Ruby's enumerable. So this was an exercise in rebuilding something that already exists and maybe not that useful. So let's move on to the second demo, which is we're going to build a fake client that calls to an API that returns books. And we want to make it so that it's really easy to configure this API. This is an example of using a block that I've used in real life in production code. It allows you to configure and set up a service or a client with a lot of ease. So uh, let's start with that. And we'll start with a failing test and we'll call it book client. So we'll make book client spec. We'll require spec helper rspec describe book client. Let's run that. It fails because we don't have book client. Again, I'm just going to put all the code in the spec because it makes it easier to see. And now we pass because we have book client. And let's do a couple things. We'll describe the class method called configure. And we'll say it yields a block that allows us to allows uh, values to be set. This would look like we'll use describe class, which is just a shorthand for book client. And describe class is actually more characters than book client, which is kind of funny. Uh, but like sometimes RuboCop would want us to use describe class. Eh, we'll use book client. I think it's more clear what we're calling. We'll say configure. Um, do 
So we're designing the API for how we're going to configure book client. We'll say uh, config. This is very common in Rails when you're setting up your Rails app. Say config API key is equal to ABC123. We'll say config dot verbose logging is equal to true. And we'll say config dot sandbox is true. Who knows, whatever, you know, whatever book client has, maybe you're building this book client so you know what the settings will be. Maybe you pass a logger in, whatever. Um, these are just examples. And then what we can say is we'll say expect book client dot config. We'll do a couple things. We'll say book client configure to be true. And then we'll say book client dot config dot API key to equal ABC. I've got multiple expects in what's a unit test, but I'm feeling okay about that. Um, up to you how that makes you feel. And then we'll say sandbox to be true. Let's run this because we've got a lot of code and we haven't run the tests yet. Undefined method configure for book client class. So we'll say class self because we're working with just a lot of class methods right now and let's define configure and we'll run that okay no method error undefined method configured we'll just let that be for now um, we'll unit test that separately because I've kind of built a whole lot with this this whole design thing we'll do let's comment out configured we'll do that in the future uh, that'll be a quickie. Okay, now here we go. We're back to what we want. Undefined method config for a book client class. So let's add def config. Undefined method API for no class because this is nil. No. So what we can do here is we can lazily memo we can memoize like lazily assign config if it's not set and we'll do struct.new so we'll use that struct again and we'll support api key and we'll support verbose logging and we'll support sandbox the struct new approach for the config so we create the new struct and then we have to initialize the new struct for the config this struct.new approach, you might want to make this its own class and you might want to add some validation to what these values are. But for us, we just keep it really simple. Run that and we'll see expected ABC123, but it instead got nil. And that's because configure is just returning nil. So we want to, our config is also returning nil. So, um, these values are all nil and we're not doing anything yet. So what we want to instead do is we'll yield config. That lets this configure work with the block and we can run that test again. And hey, it passes. So that's cool. Let's do a couple things. Um, let's say it, it uh, sets it um it who what do we want to do if you don't pass a block in it raises an exception when no block is given because we we need the block otherwise this won't work so if we call book client dot configure we'll say expect Book client that compare to raise error, maybe raise exception. We'll say something like um, no block given error. <laughs> That'll just be like our custom error, which I think is fine. So we have uninitialized concept no block given error, class no block given error, we'll inherit from standard error. Let's make that one line, just to keep this pretty concise. Uh, run this again. Expected no block given error to be raised. 
got local jump error, no block given, yield. So now we're seeing this no block given error, which I guess local jump error, I think that's kind of a not appropriate error for what we're doing. So we can say if block given, that's built into Ruby, uh, that tells us if the block was passed in. Else, we'll say raise no block given error. You must uh, give a block for to configure. All right, let's run that test again. Great, that passes. Let's actually move this down because it's kind of like an edge case. So now if someone is using book client, like we'll just do that code down here. If you call book client, whoops, dot configure, just like that, we would get no block error, or no block given error. You must give a block to configure. So that's nice. You could also, instead of this, you could set some sensible defaults, and maybe that's useful. Like maybe you say sandbox is false. And we could add tests for that. But instead, we'll say you have to pass a block because I think that's important. And let's go and um, just because we talked about it, let's do configured to determine whether or not we've configured the class. It returns true when the client has been configured. You could also say something like to be configured. That comes with our spec for free. That's the equivalent of that. So we'll keep that. We'll say, we'll copy this up here. We'll just set the API key, because that's the most important thing. Expected it to be true. Instead, we got nil, because this doesn't do anything. And then we'll just say config and config dot API key. We'll say. So that returns true. And then if we say it returns false when the client has not been configured. We'll just delete this and we'll say book client. Hmm, it might be confusing. Oh no, uh, we want to say to not be configured. Okay, that passes. If we run them all, we have some issues where the config is being called at a certain point and we're testing the class. So that is, um, that's not great. So let's figure out what we could do here. We could do something like after do book client dot config dot is equal to nil. Um, we could even do this. Um, but we're still getting issues. Interesting. I'm not sure why this is failing. Configured is config is set to something and the API key is not nil. Let's do this. Puts book client config dot API. ABC one two three ABC one two three.
Hmm, so we can manually set it to nil, which gets our test to pass, but that doesn't feel right. How would we... What could we do? Ruby destroy object. Let's Google for a second. Set it to nil. Hmm. We'll do this. This feels kind of funny, but we'll just say reset. We'll say kind of kind of weird, and we're kind of like off in the weeds with this stuff, but. All this is to say is that um, we now have this book client. It's been configured. Let's use an example of configuring it. And we'll say, we'll add a class called books that um, lets us do some things. So we'll do rspec describe books do require spec helper. Um, oops, I meant books to be book spec. And we'll say, um, we will say describe just to show you how this could work. Um, eh, let's not even do it in this. Let's just do it in this file. So if we have a class called books, and then there's a method called search. Um, that does, we'll have a query. We could then do book client dot search. Query, we don't have the search method, so we'll have to add that. And we're kind of getting in the weeds, but um, let's do books dot search. We'll just search for Murakami. And we'll run this and we'll see undefined method search for book client class because we don't have search. So let's do search query. Run it, it passes because it does that. We'll just have query do puts query just to output it. We'll see here it's running. It's also running our test. So we got a lot going on here, but um, what I want to do is say, like, if configured, else throw, you know, please configure the client. And we would instead raise an exception instead of throwing, but let's just throw for example. So please configure the client. Imagine that this, if configured in the throwing else, is in a like request class or request method that does like HTTP net HTTP, you know, request, blah, 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 and like makes the HTTP request. And you can imagine that being there, but instead we'll just do this. So what you have to do instead is say book client, maybe it's in your initializer and your Rails code or whatever. We will call configure do config. Let's say config.api key. So that is <laughs> working. It sends the query, our fake query, and is an example of using a block. Whew, that was kind of a long-winded way to get there. But why this is nice is that you can configure your book client once and then use it throughout your code, which is cool. And then you could, it's also just much easier than if you have all these settings and some of them are optional, doing something like book client and then calling the configure method and then having like, API key, if they're named, um, verbose logging, true, passing those in as params. If you add more and more options, this configure method gets really, really out of control. Where this syntax and the DSL, the domain specific language we've designed here of how to configure things, I think is quite nice and elegant. So 
that is the second example, which is a little more complicated, but it's baked into reality. And really the code that matters here is the if the block is given, then we yield the config. Otherwise we say you must give a block to configure. Cool, so that's using the block, nice. Now let's give and dive into a third, much more complex, but I think really useful example of using a block and a little bit of a further step we can take it to make it more useful. We're gonna start by defining a test for something called an API response. And that's gonna be how we drive out all of this stuff. And I think the test will better describe um, what the intention here is. So we're gonna rspec describe API response. And you can imagine in like a Rails app or Sinatra app or whatever, you have this code that you need to format a response for given objects and then return it as JSON. That's what this is gonna do. So we're gonna say describe, we're gonna have a method called build. It could be called whatever, all right? This is all hypothetical and theoretical. Uh, and we're gonna say it, we'll, we'll say it responds with API info, or with info about the API. Maybe this would be in your headers, whatever, wherever it'd be. I'm thinking about a GraphQL API kind of, where we the headers are less useful or maybe we have different attributes. So, and anyways, this is hypothetical. So let's say we would say expect API response dot build. So this is like a bare build with nothing passed in to equal, um, so we're kind of defining it, but it's gonna be JSON, and um, let's make it be, we'll have version, and we'll have like success be true, or something like that, and Let's run this and get it tailing. So uninitialize constant API response. Now we have undefined method build and it's a class method. So we'll do self build because we're only gonna have one class method here. Undefined method to JSON for the hash because we're not in Rails. So we'll do json.generate Great, now that is failing for a different reason. Expected version one, expected success true, got nil. So let's just let's call this body. And we'll make body a hash. So API version one, and we'll say success true. We'll just hard code it, right? We're just trying to get this to pass. Um, except called it version in the test, so let's just call it version. We'll make it alphabetical. Run that again, it passes. So that's not too terribly useful, right? You could do API response that build. We'll call it here. And we'll do puts. And you can see that it output this. So that's kind of neat but it's not too terribly useful yet. But where I want to use this is like, imagine in a Rails controller or some piece of code, you have like an, some objects and you want to build an API response with those objects included and then have this other information in your API response. And a block is a really nice API for that. So we'll say, we'll expand this to say it um, supports setting custom uh, response values, keys and values, we'll say. And we'll say, um, response is equal to build and we'll 
pass that and we'll say res. Uh, this will show, we'll keep building upon this to show why the block syntax is really nice here, but we'll say res and we'll say book is equal to a wild sheep chase. And then here, what I want to see is that book is set to a wild sheep chase in the test. I forgot my comma. And we'll see here that it expected the book with success and true inversion, but it instead doesn't have book because we're not doing any of our yielding. So now what we'll do is we'll yield body and run it again. It instead appended at the end, so we just need to move this down here in our test because body is first built here and then we yield body. So these will be first in the values. So um, let's just run just that test. We'll see it passes. Run all the tests. We'll see that this is failing. It's failing because of that local jump error. So we're back to the local jump error. That's because we're calling API response.build without a block, but we're always yielding. We just go back to if block given, run that, all our tests pass. So this is nice. You can go and build this API response, set the values you want, and kind of craft this response instead of doing something like, um, you could do API response.build and set response directly. And that would, it would in theory work, implicit conversion of symbol into integer. Oh, well, no, it wouldn't work <laughs> because response is a string of JSON. So if response was a hash, we could do that. But then what we would have to do, like let's say API response return a hash and we did this, then we would have to do json.generate response. And the nicety of this API is that build generates the JSON for us. So that is a nice thing. And then I'm about to show another nice part of block that takes our usage of blocks and expands it even further. So it supports setting custom response keys and values, which is nice. You can imagine maybe there are some other things you'd want to include here, or maybe there's some other side effects or things you want to have happen. Like maybe you want to change, like you could imagine changing, um, like some data formatting. Sometimes you have API data formatting to um, make things better. Or like you maybe you have a page, right? And we'll uh, get to that in a second. But um, like you could have for pagination, you could have like page one, and then you could add code that handles responding with which page is in here. But I think that's beyond the scope of this, but let's do one more step to um, make this even more useful. And just to like show you here, if down here we called it API response.build. Oh no, I don't need to show that because we have a test that shows that it works. Um, okay, let's do one final example for this third demo. And we'll do something that says like, it supports uh, resolving objects. And this is going to be a very trivial example that you could imagine a world in where you have like uh, resolvers that handle different objects and include different data based on that. But let's do, we'll just keep working with books and we'll say book one is a double again. So we're back to using doubles. We'll say title a wild sheep chase. Then we'll have book two and we'll say the title is uh, Kafka, I'm sure. These are Haruki Murakami books. He's on my mind lately because I've been reading his books. And instead of doing res book, let's instead do, we'll add this new syntax or we'll like combine it. So we'll do res, we'll just say like response 
we'll say this object type we'll just put book because why not uh, we're just making this all up so we'll say we're gonna combine this type of setting the response directly and then we're also going to do something that is um, kind of cool too. We're going to do response dot resolve object book one, and we're going to do response dot resolve object book two. And what I want to is say have we have these objects? That's an array because we are resolving multiple of them, and it's just going to be the type of the books. And this is where you maybe have custom resolvers and we're gonna code it specifically for title, but let's go and run this. We see no method error, undefined method resolve object for our hash because we're calling res on our hash. So let's go and back up to build and we're gonna change the way this works quite a bit, but I think it's gonna be pretty cool. So we have our body hash, which is neat. But what we don't have is resolve object. So what we'll instead do is we'll say, um, we'll do new for API response. Call it res is new. We'll put this in our initialize. Initialize. We'll have an adder Accessor called body. So we'll say self.body will just always set these values to be for the API response. And maybe there's ways we'd want to set those to be different versions or whatever. Um, a lot of this would be configurable. But instead, we'll say res.new and then we'll yield the res, which is an instance of API response if the block's given. And then we'll, we'll generate it with the response body which is the hash. So now let's run the test and see what happens. Still undefined method resolve object. Okay. I'm not gonna unit test this, but like normally when building out something like this, you definitely wanna unit test it. Um, we'll take resolve object and we will um, have the object and we'll do some stuff with it. But let's just run the test again undefined method, um, like cache access, that's from this object type, uh, not working anymore. So we'll also do that. We'll say uh, def the hash accessor. Um, I don't know how this works exactly, but let's just do it and see if this works. That's why we have tests. We'll say key is equal to value um, because why this worked before, like in this code, why res and then the hash accessor worked before is because res was the body hash, but now res is an instance of API response. So we've changed the way that works. And now run the test, runs again, but we have a different uh, failure, which is that object type book is set, so we can still set the, um, we can still modify res, which is cool, uh, and set values on the hash directly, but we are getting, we aren't getting the objects array. So we need to actually implement resolve object. And this is where you could imagine something like object dot, um, you could say like, so we're not gonna code this cause it's like, it would expand the scope of this screencast even further. But imagine something where you had like object dot serializer like imagine objects had serializers or there was a method that f found the class instance. You could do like object.serializer.new. You could actually just say object. call it like resolve. And it would like, you know, do some stuff that's coded into the way that uh, that class works. But instead, we're just going to keep it really simple. We're going to say self.body. Um, objects is equal to an array and we'll say 
So we have self dot body and we have the key of objects and we're going to set it to an array that um, I'm going to just do this object dot type and the you know the resolver or the serializer or whatever would have the logic for what to include but this is our trivial example so we can just let it be all right let's run the test undefined method pushed for a nil class so what we would say here is we would say if um, we'll say something like this objects is equal to self dot body objects which is going to be nil at times. So we'll say or empty array. And then we'll say objects.push object.title. And we'll say self.body. There's probably a different way to do this. Let's go to objects. But for the sake of this, let's just use that. Run that. We've got object type books and then objects. Here we've got objects and then object type book. So it's like the order of this. It'd be nice if we made these tests a little more resilient, but we're just working with um, strings of JSON and um, get the examples. Let's run all our tests. Great, they all pass. Cool beans. That is one way that we're using a block. And I think that's pretty neat um, and pretty useful. We could have different things like res.body if we wanted to change the syntax here to be instead of res and overriding the hash accessor, we could say body. We could modify body directly by passing in a second param, which is something we haven't done yet. And um, I don't know if I like that syntax any better, but now we have the API response instance that build creates, and we have body, which is the hash directly. So like we could modify it that way. I don't love that, but just know that that's like something you could do. But what I wanna do is actually change something to be uh, this res.resolve object. I think it's a bit, um, we could simplify it to just be resolve object without calling res. Like we can implicitly execute it with res, which is cool. Uh, so let's remove that and run it. You see undefined method resolve object for RSpec example group, etc. That's because the, the scope of this block being executed is within our RSpec example group and not in the scoping of API response build. So what we can do here is we can actually take our block, pass in with the ampersand like we talked about earlier. We can just say if block. And then instead of calling yield, we'll actually call um, instance exec with the, we will call, sorry, res.instance exec, and then we will call it with the block, if we have the block specified. Let's run that again. I think this needs to be an ampersand. Let's see. Ah, yes. But now we're getting an issue with line 63 not working, where nil is um, being called in a way that um, where res is nil. So that is a different problem. I think it would be this. So now that passes in that we um, execute all this code within the context of res. Um, but I don't know if I actually like that more. So that's something to sort of consider. Um, that will work too. If you run all our tests, they actually fail because Line 44, here, we don't have this concept of the res block. Let's see if we can change that, though. Let's 
that might be really bad, and I don't know what's going to happen. But we're living and we're learning. Gosh, I don't think that's going to work. Yeah, nope, that isn't going to work. But um, instance exec is interesting in that it allows us to do things like this resolve object, which is pretty nice. So um, you can get rid of the self and all that. But, and like that's how our spec works, where before gets called and um, describing it. But I actually don't like that having walked through it in this example. So um, I think this is a much better API, to be honest, even though it's a little more verbose and we have to repeat res. Um, it's just, it's just like, yeah, oh, I keep going back and forth. I think this is where like this kind of design becomes difficult, but you could also say something like, um, you could call set. This is like, this is like a way we could get around the problem with the hash assigning. Or we'll say, why don't we say, yeah, we'll just say set. I like set. Um, and then up here, instead of res book, we would say set book to that. And then what we would end up doing is this would go away. Or like this method would change to be um, just be set. And we run that and it passes. So. Yeah, I guess that's better. Sorry that I don't have a strong opinion on that. Um, I think you could go either way, where you have the block param of the instance of API response, and you call res. Which is cool, um, because it's like, it's really explicit, which I like. The res is explicit. Just like how our config was explicit, but the problem with this, or not the problem with it, is like you're just going to repeat res a bunch. So if you wanted to not repeat res, and you just know, and the, the documentation is really clear that like inside the block of API res, you call resolve object, and you have set, and you have these different methods. That's this really nice way where you could craft a response and include the extra metadata that comes from here while also resolving all those instances. So I hope that helps. Instance exec is cool, and it essentially says to the instance that we instantiated here, that we initialized, run this block of code if the block is supplied in, in the context of it. So it goes and it takes all the resolve objects and the set calls and runs it. Um, so you get the best of both worlds, where we have book one and book two passed in. But we're also running these methods within the context of um, API response, that instance. Doing this with method calls would be pretty, like, pretty not great. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't love it. Um, like, just to show why this has value at the end. We would do something like API response dot new. And then you could do res dot resolve object book one, res dot resolve object book two, res dot set object type work. And maybe this all happens in a hash. <laughs> like maybe you call res dot body and you assign it. And you could even call these out or whatever. Um, and then you would do like res dot to JSON. You do res dot set version. You know all that stuff. You have all of these. Um, what was the other thing that we set up here? Just success, which is just some random boolean. But like you have all of this. We we basically lose these three lines 
and the instantiation of res. And maybe to JSON or there's some like generate method that automatically does these. But I think this is a much more elegant API that um, as the needs of this would evolve, like the API building, as the needs evolve, you could expand this API to be more useful, to include more objects, to better resolve the objects. And uh, I just really like it. I think it's a good example of using a block. So in summary, we've got instance exec, which runs the block within the context of the instantialized object. We've got our client example, where we take and yield the config object that can then be used to set a bunch of values to configure something. And then we've got our examples of iterating through an object and acting upon each one and then returning something different. That's what blocks are. They're anonymous functions. They have access to the scoping that they're called within and then uh, whatever, like the scope that they're executed within and then whatever is calling them has some scoping too. Um, they're really cool. You can really make some neat APIs for your code that's internal or if you're building a library. I hope that helped. And maybe in the future, I'll dive more into procs and uh, lambdas and uh, some other stuff that's like pretty neat. But between writing classes, methods, and then using blocks, and then building your own blocks, you'll get really far. Thank you so much. I hope this is fun and not too out there and too uh, rambly, but I wanted to make a definitive, thorough, multi-example guide to blocks in Ruby. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye.